I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Waters. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The biggest cause of climate change is the extraction and burning of coal and gas. To prevent the climate crisis getting worse, no new coal and gas projects can be developed in Australia. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, Sorry, I just need to check. Is that supported? I was way too quick. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. If Australians want to read some shocking numbers in relation to this debate today, um, I suggest they go and Google Renew Economy. Um, Katan Joshi has tweeted a thread on this today because he wrote an article today on just how many tonnes, millions of tonnes of emissions of coming from approvals of new fossil fuel projects are going to dwarf this government's 43 per cent emissions reduction commitment. Uh, according to numbers that he, uh, he published today—this uh, is based on an Australian Institute report from last year—the uh, government's uh, emissions reduction pledge, based on their 43 per cent uh, ambition, uh, they were going to avoid 366 million tonnes of CO2 between 2023 and 2030. So that's if we sign up and agree to reducing emissions by 43 per cent. That's how much carbon uh, will be avoided under this scheme. But if all new coal and gas mines are approved and start running, they'll cause domestically over a million and thirty million tonnes. So. Uh, nearly three times the amount that we're going to reduce through fugitive emissions and, of course, all the uh, CO2 burnt uh, mining and extracting this. That's domestically, but overseas, if these are exported and burned, um, 11,176 million tonnes of CO2 will be burnt into the atmosphere. So, in other words, hundreds of times more CO2 is going to be emitted than reduced under Labor's targets if, in this government, they continue to approve fossil fuel projects. Now, um, Adam Bant, the leader of the Greens, said you don't, uh, you don't tackle a climate crisis by pouring more fuel onto the fire. This is exactly what the Greens have campaigned on going to this election, that there's no point in having these climate targets for 2030 or 2050 if you're going to continue to approve new fossil fuel projects. Now, we got just a, a short and brief insight today from Senator Wong at Question Time as to how Labor is going to spin this. And we are deep in an era of greenwashing, and we're going to see a lot more of it. So it's really important that people understand this. Senator Wong basically said, this is not Australia's problem. These are scope one emissions. Uh, we're talking about reducing domestic emissions on our targets. But if other countries buy Australia's coal and buy our gas and burn them, well, that's not our problem. That's their problem. And of course, uh, Mr Albanese, our new Prime Minister, has also uh, repeated the lines that Susan Lay and previous environment ministers and previous prime ministers have repeated that somehow our coal is cleaner and better beneficial to these countries than other sources. The old drug dealer's defence, and you heard it here in the Senate today, that's what it is. Um, if, you don't buy, if you don't buy my drugs, these people down the road are going to get drugs from someone else that's going to be worse off for them. What a ridiculous argument. If we commit to climate action, we commit to protecting future generations, we commit to protecting our natural environment, we commit to protecting our farming sector, we commit to protecting our communities from extreme weather events like floods and fires. If we commit to ending species extinction, then we must commit to no new fossil fuel projects in this country. And this is not just the Greens 
saying this. Our 75 per cent target is based on the Paris Agreement and the science, and it is the United Nations and all the experts that are saying we must end the era of fossil fuels by absolutely 100 per cent stamping out new fossil fuel projects. That's it. That's what the science tells us is necessary. And we're still talking here uh, at a 43 per cent emissions reduction target by Labor of a two degree warming. All the impacts we've seen uh, in our climate emergency have come from one degree of warming. Even the Paris target of 1.5 degree warming still assumes a 50 per cent increase in the latent heat on this planet based on what we've already seen, which is still potentially catastrophic. But we are going to be debating like doubling the amount of heat on this planet and getting to net zero by 2050? What's the point of getting net zero by 2050 if there's no barrier reef left? And we've irrevocably changed the way we live on this planet. We need to act now, and the only way we can act is to end all new fossil fuel projects, full stop, period. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be um, addressing the Senate today. Um, not only is my role as a senator for Queensland and not only as um, someone who has long argued for climate action, uh, but also in my new position as the special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, as someone who lives in Cairns, I understand more than most people how important it is for us to protect the Great Barrier Reef and to make sure that we have not only um, this asset to enjoy for many generations to come, but to protect the jobs that the reef relies on. And we want to make sure that in um, taking up this role as a special reef envoy, there are a number of issues that I am keen to address and a number of uh, issues that I am keen to talk to many stakeholders about. Um, since being appointed to the role, I've had the opportunity to speak to conservation groups, tourism operators, um, I've had a chance to speak to agricultural leaders um, and also, of course, traditional owners who in this space are doing fantastic work. Um, uh, Australians made a clear choice on the 21st of May and they are ready for action on climate change and they're ready for a Labor government to deliver it. And in all of the conversations that I've had with people around the Great Barrier Reef, in this role as the Special Reef Envoy, it has been um, clear to me that people are incredibly hopeful for the future now that there has been a change of government. They are incredibly hopeful about the plans that Labor has put in place and the things that we have said that we will do to take action on climate change and to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Today, our government has taken one of those very important steps, and we've introduced legislation to take action on climate change to make sure that this bill does what the previous government failed to do over a decade in power. So I'm very proud to be here today as part of this government and as the special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef as we send a very clear message that the time for action on climate change is now. And the stability and certainty that is going to come from legislating this target is clear for all Australians to see and it is important for Australians and their future. Because our government will not waste the opportunities that have come with climate action. We know that, as uh, Senator Wong said today in question time, this is not only a matter of protecting our environment but also an economic question and the jobs that can come from investing in renewable energy. We know that the previous government was so opposed to taking action on climate change that they vetoed renewable energy projects because it was against their own policy. Um, uh, they um, you know, tried to take the R out of arena and they actively are still standing up against climate change. Our government will not be one of inaction and waste when it comes to this important issue and that's why we will deliver on our mandate of a 43 per cent target. Um, today the Albanese Labor government introduced climate change bill enshrining 43 per cent emissions reductions into law. This puts on track it puts us on track to reach net zero by 2050 and restores our international reputation as a responsible global citizen. This legislation brings much needed certainty to workers, businesses, communities and our energy needs change. We prepare for, to reap the benefits of a renewable energy future. Today, Labor restored accountability and certainty in Australia's climate approach. The climate change and energy minister will now be required to report our progress to the parliament. 
and making sure that we are being transparent and ambitious when we strive to reach net zero. This legislation represents a hard-fought consensus on climate change amongst Australians. It has the support of businesses, associations, unions, environmental groups and community organisations. And as the Minister for Climate Change has said, this is a critical first step and the experts will continue to inform our approach to targets moving forward. This is the first step, a step that Australians have waited so long to see taken, and we are taking this step as a government now. The legislation will enshrine nationally determined contribution of 43 per cent emissions. It will task, as I said, the Climate Change Authority to provide advice to Australians progressing against these targets. It will require the minister to report annually to parliament on the progress, and it will finally, um, uh, in other legislation, reinsert the renewables component to, are to ARENA. This is on top of Labor's plan to power Australia. It complements our plan to create jobs, cut power bills and reduce submissions through our Powering Australia plan. Labor's plan will upgrade the electricity grid, make electric vehicles cheaper and invest in green manufacturing. The Powering Australia plan will deliver over 600,000 jobs across the country, with five out of six of those jobs created in regional Australia. It will cut power bills for families and businesses as we take advantage of Australia's vast natural resources. Our Powering Australia plan is another example of Labor's ambitious and resourceful approach when we are talking, taking on the challenge of climate change. We won't bury our heads in the sand. We know that this is complex. We know that there are issues that we need to see through. We won't see them through a singular lens. Labor takes up the challenge and finds a way to solve this issue and deliver real social and economic returns for Australia, the Australian people. This is in direct contrast with the last decade of denial and delay. It is clear that under the former government, um, Australians had lost hope. They had lost hope. Um, after a decade of chaos on renewable energy, Labor's climate change bill will finally give certainty so desperately needed for businesses, industry, energy, investors and the wider community. In my community of regional Queensland, we have seen hundreds of jobs evaporate as a result of the disunity among the previous government on climate change. And I note this disunity continues in the opposition. Um, they are obviously given an opportunity to join the government to vote for our legislation. They've indicated that they will not be doing that, although I know that the disunity continues within the opposition. Uh, it really begs the question about who and what the, the opposition has been listening to, and clearly they didn't hear the message from the Australian people at the last election. There are real and serious consequences from the previous government's actions that Labor is just now having the opportunity to start cleaning up. And we will work with people across this chamber to achieve outcomes for all Australians. We will work with people who want to see climate action put into reality. We will be constructive. But the Australian people know that what, what Labor took to the last election, they understand that plan that we have, the Powering Australia plan. They understand that we have a commitment to 43 per cent target. They understand that that was not a target or a number plucked out of thin air, but something that we put together by understanding through independent modelling what levers the government could pull, what emissions reductions we could achieve if we pulled those levers. This is something that we have taken to the Australian people, and now as a government we are planning to legislate these targets. It is uh, an opportunity, I think, for this parliament to rise above the divisive politics of the climate wars in the, under the previous government, under um, uh, the, former, the former government, where we saw climate wars um, uh, deliver nothing but political debate in this space. And we know there are people in this chamber who need to understand that we are here to deliver on our election commitments. We are here to listen and we will be constructive, and I think we have been constructive when it comes to the negotiations on the legislation. But we have a very clear mandate, we have a very clear agenda, and we are delivering on that agenda. And when it comes to climate change, 
Every time I'm on my feet in this place, I continue to remind the chamber that there are people in our country, in Queensland right now, who are feeling the effects of climate change. Uh, we visited, uh, along with the Minister for Climate Change and the Assistant Minister for Climate Change, Senator McAllister, had the opportunity to um, go to the Torres Strait a few weeks ago. And we sat down with those community members, and it was a real honour to listen to them directly, to see the changes that are happening, the coastal erosion. And it really begs the question that if anyone, any person from that side of the chamber can hear those personal stories, can see that coastal erosion occurring, and still choose to think that this is not a place where we need to get down and get the work done on climate change, then I don't understand what they are here for. What we've got from the opposition so far is more denials, more diversion, more debate and delay. But this government, a Labor government, is getting on with the job. And that is why we have put this legislation to the parliament. And we'll give the parliament an opportunity to discuss that legislation, to talk about the value of acting on climate change. But it, we will get this done. And if the parliament does not legislate the target, we will still set about achieving the things that we promised the Australian people, because the time is now. Senator Dunian. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I have to commend Senator Green for getting through 10 minutes on a motion, or sorry, an MPI put forward by the Greens around banning coal and gas without mentioning either of those particular fossil fuels. I was uh, enlightened uh, by your um, contribution there about the uh, Labor Party, now government's uh, policies to legislate, but I'm still at a loss to understand, based on that contribution, where you stand on this MPI. But I'm sure other government speakers will enlighten us on exactly where they stand. But I'll put on record my views and the views of the opposition here, which have been made clear time and time again. Sometimes, though, I do think some in this place live in a par parallel uh, universe. And I think we could be forgiven for thinking that, because today we saw inflation numbers released—6.1 per cent. And that's a figure that I don't think we should just brush off and forget about and not pay attention to the impact that's going to have on Australian households and businesses, job-creating entities. Uh, these sorts of things are an important context to uh, set as a backdrop for the debate that the Greens have so generously put down for us. Uh, the motion, which I'll read again. Um, uh, as put forward by Senator Waters, the biggest causes of climate change is the extraction and burning of coal and gas. And to prevent the climate, climate crisis from getting worse, no new coal and gas projects can be developed in Australia. Now, that is a standalone statement they've spoken to today, but the impacts of doing that, I think, on the economy. And I mentioned earlier on today that there are two fragile things that we need to take into account here. One, the environment, and two, the economy. Environmental decisions have an impact on the economy, on people's jobs, on their ability to pay power bills, keep food on the table, keep their businesses running. And to make a decision over here with absolutely no regard for what impact it has over here is a ridiculous approach to public policy, and that is exactly what we're seeing here. I can see why Senator Green refused to even go near it, because it is difficult for the Labor Party to uh, reconcile their rhetoric around fossil fuels and the problems they're going to have when it comes to the Australian Greens and trying to legislate in this place and deal with their demands when it comes to things like this. I've already mentioned inflation hitting 6.1 per cent, a many dec decades record being hit, which is, as I say, going to have an impact. We know that power prices, similarly, are going sky high. And from June 2021, that Prices have gone up in the national electricity market by two to three hundred per cent. That's a huge amount. We know that Labor won't be able to fulfil their promise to the Australian people from just nine weeks ago that uh, uh, power bills will go down by two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Uh, bank interest rates are going up. Fuel, cost of fuel to put in your car is going up, and Australian households are hurting. They're doing it tough. And so, when on the first substantive day of sitting in this parliament, in the Australian Senate, we're here debating this issue with absolutely no regard for the impact that it has on households and businesses. I think it's something Australians need to wake up and listen to and see what these sorts of policies, this sort of direction has on the impact of households that are doing it tough, Australians that work hard. 
It is something, frankly, that uh, I think the Greens should probably reflect upon, uh, given this demonstrates how out of touch they are with Australians who just want to get on and live their lives and want the government to bring in policies that help them live their lives, make a better future for themselves and their children, have a go, get rewarded, you know, those great Australian ideals. But, as I say, this, this uh, MPI has been written with zero regard for the impact such a call would have on the ability for honest, hard-working Australians to make a go of things. Um, look, we already know the facts around how much uh, these resources specified in this MPI contribute to energy generation in this country. The great bulk of energy generated in this country is from these resources. Now, we know there are plans to, and of course the government have outlined their plan to transition to renewables, but the idea that you can just shut down exploration and expansion of existing resources, which are going to be needed, any expert will tell you that, without forcing businesses and households, hospitals, schools to turn the lights off, the heaters off, uh, you know, it is a short-sighted, cynical stunt which will have bad impacts on Australians. And we don't know when the existing resource, let's say this thing, this uh, MPI, and what the Greens would love to do to Australia, let's, let's say in some dystopian world this became reality. Um, when would the lights switch off? In five years, ten years? When would we be able to, well, not be able to keep the lights on in schools or uh, store in appropriate refrigeration units, vital medicines in hospitals? When would we stop being able to do that? When would you be sitting in the dark at home eating your dinner? When would the factories stop being able to do what they do best, manufacture something we want to do more of here with our resources rather than outsourcing it to countries that do burn fossil fuels, something you guys seem to forget about? The jobs are lost, the businesses are shut down and the cycle goes on and on. And this is something that these trite statements, these motions that we see from time to time, never ever take uh, account of and never have any regard for. Those people that work in those industries, those people impacted, they don't matter apparently. And we only have to come down to Tasmania, uh, where, of course, we do have businesses that do rely on coal to be able to do what they do. The Railton cement factory, for one, something, I don't know, we've got this shortage of material to go into the housing and construction sector. But you know, let's say the Fingal Colliery runs out of coal and needs to expand. I presume if the Greens had their way, we'd no longer be able to source coal. We wouldn't be able to produce concrete to be able to feed that plant and, of course, the housing and construction sector. But that doesn't matter. How about the Norske Skog, uh, Skog um, paper mill in the Derwent Valley? doesn't matter. They use coal to fire their boilers. They're looking for alternatives, of course. I'm sure they're ones that we'd want to stand in the way of. But as it stands, under your motion, We'd be standing in the way of that, and the five, six hundred jobs in the Derwent Valley, who cares? Don't worry. That community does not matter. And this is the thing no regard for these people, and no consideration at all for the flow on effects that this would have for the economy and indeed also for the environment. And I'm waiting to see what the alternatives are, because I look at a bit of recent history around what we could be doing. Because if we're shutting down fossil fuel use and no more new gas or coal uh, operations and projects across this country, then where are we sourcing this energy that we need to be a competitive economy from? This fragile economy I talked about before, the one that's facing the economic headwinds that the government have already been talking about, that the international community is bracing for, where do we get this alternative energy from? Because we know, and I heard Senator Wish Wilson refer to renew economy uh, a little earlier on, and I was having a look at that website, and there was a, a link on there talking about how the Greens uh, opposed Marinus, the Marinus Link, a vital piece of infrastructure which is there to generate investment in renewable energy, in the battery of the nation, expanding our hydro generation. Oh, but no, we can't have that. So, OK, we can't have hydro, and we all know the Greens were given birth to out of the Franklin Dam dispute, so they're definitely against hydro. They also oppose the Robbins Island wind farm, one example of renewables they're opposed to. So we've got hydro, we've got wind, no go. So where are we getting this energy from? They want to be a part of the solution here, but they don't provide solutions. They just tell us what we shouldn't be doing. They have no regard for honest, hard-working men and women that will be impacted by this. But I'm not surprised by this, and I doubt a great many Australians would be either. 
to be honest, to be honest with you. And you know, we in Tasmania know exactly what we're dealing with here when it comes to this sort of thing and the party behind the movement of such MPRs and motions. When you have the Greens near the levers of power, bad things happen. We warned Australians about this, and here we are, the first substantive day of sitting in the Senate, and this is the first thing they chuck down. So can I tell you, this is what we need to expect, and it is a word of warning to the Australian Labor Party, the government. We all know you have two pathways to legislate in this place, and one of them is in fact with the Australian Greens. And we've just been given a sneak preview of the kinds of things, I dare say probably the stuff that they've been laying on the table in your negotiations over your legislated 43 per cent reduction in emissions bill. This is what the world is in for in Australia. At a time when people can't pay their mortgages, can't pay their power bills, can't put fuel in the car, this is what the Australian Greens are proposing. It is a dim, dark future, not just because we can't keep the lights on, but because the policies this crew put forward are bad for Australia, are bad for businesses, households, and will mean economic destruction and the removal of our ability to compete in the international economy. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not my first, first speech. I rise today to speak about the call from people in the ACT and millions of Australians around the country for policy decisions in the 47th Parliament to be guided by science. For the past few years, faced with unprecedented challenges, a global public health emergency, science has guided health policy. Scientists have been celebrated for their quick, their quick work developing vaccines. We have valued and respected their research. We need to extend that value and respect to all of our scientists. We need to depoliticise critical debates and start to genuinely listen to our scientists. We have rightly heard calls for a science-based response to the potentially devastating threat that foot and mouth disease poses to Australia. We need the same when it comes to the science around climate and environment. The evidence is significant and requires an urgent response. The latest IPCC report, the result of the best scientific minds examining hard evidence, states that greenhouse gas emissions must peak by 2025 if we are to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The IPCC's advice could not be clear, clearer. We cannot afford new fossil fuel projects in Australia. Rather than opening new fossil fuel facilities, focus should be given to the incredible opportunities offered by a transition to clean energy and a focus on ensuring regional Australia benefits from this clean energy transition. Australia's renewable energy reserves are 75 per cent greater than our combined reserves of coal, oil, gas and uranium. Clean energy exports could be worth almost triple the value of Australia's existing fossil fuel exports. In addition to benefits for regional communities, transition to clean energy will improve the lives of those in suburban Australia. Rooftop solar is a great Australian success story. Started under the Howard government, we now have some of the cheapest rooftop solar in the world. With the right policy, we can do the same for battery, heat pumps and electric vehicles. In the ACT, electrification of households would save households on average $5,000 per year. At a time when cost of living pressures are hurting so many in our community, these savings are more important than ever. In order to make this transition, we must move away from coal and gas and focus on the renewable technologies of the future. The 47th Parliament has the opportunity to get on with this. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, it was only a few months ago that I stood in this chamber and spoke about the clear message being sent from South Australia about what they wanted to see in a government. I highlighted then that they wanted real action on climate change, more jobs and cheaper power. The election result made it clear, made it very clear just how true that was. In every state and territory, Australians were very clear on their desire for change. And many of us believe that a lot of that was driven by the desire for action on climate change. 
They voted for a government that will respect ambitious reduction targets. They voted for a government that will work alongside community, industry and, importantly, the scientists. And now, as a government, we have the opportunity to change, and we value the importance of this place, and we value and respect the diversity of views that are held within this chamber and the other place. Those views deserve to be heard. They deserve to be considered, and ultimately they deserve to consider compromise to get the best outcome for the Australian people. I understand that the Greens have a particular view about new coal and gas projects, and that is their right, and I acknowledge that that was their publicly stated policy position prior to the election. It's what they campaigned on, and they were very clear with the Australian people. Our policy differs, and that was also very clear in the lead-up to the election. We have been very clear that any new coal and gas project needs to stack up. And the simple reality is that the renewable investment in this country is booming and that Labor, the Labor government has significant plans to boost development in renewable energy, to improve our electricity system and to head towards net zero in 2050. In that scenario, many coal and glass projects just simply don't add up. A company having an idea or having a proposal for a new coal or gas project does not necessarily mean it's going to occur, does not necessarily mean that it will make it through their board approval processes, does not necessarily mean they are going to get the investment and the finance that they need for that project. If they do manage to get that far, then we do have our environmental standards, noting uh, Senator Waters concern about the strength of those standards, um, but they are processes nonetheless to ensure that projects have what is seen to be a reasonable um, pathway. So, subject to a project passing all of those hurdles, we do then have a very clear safeguard mechanism, which we will bring in. And that will apply to any project, any new project, emitting over 100,000 tonnes. This safeguard mechanism is designed to ensure that we reach our goal, a goal that we are deeply committed to, of net zero by 2050. Providing those emitting facilities with certainty as to their emissions trajectory and providing certainty for anyone wishing to invest in such projects makes it clear about the future for that project. And under that scenario, many of those projects may not stack up. What we won't be doing is making empty promises for new projects that possibly won't come to fruition, like so often happened after the last decade under the previous government. This was our very clear policy that we brought to the election the very clear policy that the Australian people knew we had when they gave us the honour of being their government. Prior to coming to this chamber, I have had the great pleasure of being the executive director of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, which gave me the opportunity to work extensively with the scientific community and with industry on the urgent need for climate action. We spent a very long time banging our heads against the wall with a lack of action from the government of the day. But the scientific community, working alongside the business community, reflecting on the industries of the future, as well as the good of the planet, you can make a positive pathway through that. And that is where Labor sees the answer. Over many years, I've had the great opportunity to work with environmental advocates, including some from the agricultural sector, and to hear for them how clear, concise, transparent climate action is for their work. It is vital. There is a pathway here. There is a pathway we intend to take. 
The one consistent theme that we have seen for well over a decade is that everyone is sick and tired of the uncertainty around climate policy in this country. We became an international laughing stock under the previous government. We have already, as the new Labor government, made strong inroads to change that. And that is not just about looking good on the international stage. That is about investment in Australia. That is about the opportunity for our businesses to grab the opportunity to amend their business, to work towards low emissions, to zero emissions, and to reap the benefits of the fact that the international community is looking down that pathway, is moving down that pathway. Climate change is an opportunity for our businesses to get on board. One consistent theme, as I've said, is this issue around the uncertainty, the division and the political game playing. This is an area that has been plagued by political opportunism, policy immaturity, obfuscation, and we welcome the constructive discussions that have been occurring between the government and the crossbench, particularly the Australian Greens. They've come to the table in good faith. They've come to the table with ideas and we welcome that and thank them for that effort. Unfortunately, the other side of the chamber is quite a different situation, and we have seen the Leader of the Opposition refuse to engage in this conversation, to try to continue the divisive, destructive approach to climate change. Thankfully, they were voted out. Hopefully, in this next term, they might learn something about bringing the country together rather than dividing it. We do not need to divide our country again over climate policy. We have a strong pathway that is very clear, that gives industry and communities certainty, and that opens and enhances numerous opportunities in new and emerging sectors, including hydrogen something I'm very passionate about, and we've seen some excellent opportunities in the Upper Spencer Gulf um, that is exciting the whole community from a development perspective, from a jobs perspective, and also from a reducing emissions and addressing climate change perspective. In our bill that has been introduced into the House of Representatives, we honour all of those commitments that we made during the election. It contains 43 per cent reduction target by 2030. It has an independent climate change authority to provide advice on our progress and help ensure our commitment to the obligations we've made under the Paris Agreement. Our policy has covered accountability, transparency and the contrast between the past government and the current government. We sincerely hope that this bill will pass. We sincerely hope that the level of engagement, consultation that has occurred with all of the relevant stakeholders, including environmentalists, business, industry, this is a policy, this is a bill that actually addresses critical issues in an agreed, consulted and transparent manner. We know that we are going to find objection from the Liberal opposition. We know we're going to find objection from the Nationals Party. We know that this is not what the Australian public want. This is a chance to come together. This is a chance to make a difference for the future of Australia. This is a crisis and we need to address it. Senator McDonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. There's a great saying I heard when attending the Queensland Mining and Engineering Expo in Mackay earlier this month. If it's not made of steel, it's made in a factory made of steel. Yeah, yeah. Now, not one federal Labor or Green politician attended the expo, a fact that was noted with concern and surprise by the sector's heavyweights gathered there, given not only the economic but also the environmental contribution of this industry. 
Any public display of support by Labor for mining companies would jeopardise their attempts to gain green support for our second most important sector, and they have shown their hand. Labor's reliance on the Greens continues to threaten Australia's coal and gas industries, which are key pillars of our economy that continue to provide affordable and secure electricity, jobs and funds vital services. Because it is only prosperous economies that can afford to be good environmental managers. This is why we must pr protect the economy. The Australian resources industry is creating jobs, business opportunities and investment, especially in regional Australia. In 2020-21, the resources and energy sector accounted for around 10 per cent of Australia's GDP. The sector's exports made up around two-thirds of Australia's total export earnings. The Greens continue to make up numbers about the sector while ignoring the fact that it is ensuring our energy security. The lessons of the past few months is that energy security equals national security for all Australians. And if you live in a mining sector and you voted for Labor or have a Labor representative, this is what you're getting. Dirty deals with people who want to cut the artery to Australia's economic heart and to regional Australia. Our food, our homes, our cars, yes, even the electric ones, devices and clothes all exist thanks to mining or machines made by mining. Even the rapidly growing rare earths mining sector, a key plank in battery production for renewable energy, needs heavy steel machinery to function. And the most efficient way to make steel is using coal in blast furnaces. The Greens and their supporters reveal a lack of understanding when they make outlandish claims about coal mining. Coal is an ingredient in, solar, in silicon solar panels. Wind turbines are made predominantly of steel and concrete, which are made using coal. And on most days, coal-fired power makes up 54 per cent of, an, of our national energy generation, and gas makes up 20 per cent of our generation. We simply cannot afford to cut new coal and gas developments. Now, the Greens like to think they're smarter than everyone else. So what's the plan to replace that 70 per cent of baseload power generation? More renewables? We just don't yet have the battery technology to ensure that the lights stay on when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And South Australia is held up as the gold standard for renewables, but multiple times at the start of June, that state was drawing more than 80 per cent of its power from gas and diesel as windless days arrived. The South Australians are also installing a battery on Torrens Island the size of Adelaide Oval at a cost of $180 million that will have one entire hour of storage. Most people support the idea of renewable energy, but we must ensure that the transition is timed to coincide with replacement baseload energy generation coming online. Not only that, we need to build new transmission lines, conservatively costed at $14 billion from the new sources of power to the grid. AEMO is mapping transmission lines, but how many reach the regions where the renewable energy uh, places are, are situated? It's why Copper String is a critical transmission line to connect the Minerals Province of the northwest in Queensland through to Townsville to access not only the renewable energy projects, but also to take energy to those mining projects. The transition needs to be gradual, but the Greens demand we switch off coal virtually overnight. Meanwhile, other countries are restarting coal-fired power stations or building new ones. Not only does that negate any of the meagre emission savings we make here, those countries need coal, and it should be high-quality Australian coal. By 2025, Germany will have spent more than half a trillion euros on renewables and is still only drawing 34 per cent of its energy needs from renewables. Less than a month ago, due to disruption to Russian gas supplies, the German parliament was forced to pass emergency legislation to restart previously mothballed coal-fired power plants just to keep the lights on. The media reports authorities will also bulldoze a historic church to get at coal reserves underneath. And just remember, it's still summer there. So what can they expect in the bitterly cold European winter? And that's right, it will be coal to the rescue. The German experience proves that energy security equals national security for all Australians. 
but while other countries recognise this, the Greens missed the memo. In 2021 alone, the world added 1.45 million megawatts of new coal-fired power. I got that from the Global Coal Plant Tracker. 80 per cent of that is in China and India, two countries not bound by international emissions reductions agreements. And we can see in Victoria the emerging issue of energy supply, security and affordability. Coal-fired power makes up 54 per cent of our national energy generation and gas makes up 20 per cent of our generation. We simply cannot afford to cut new coal and gas developments. Coal prices are at a historic high, and this is due only to one thing—demand. Demand that is tipped to grow to record levels this coming financial year. The world needs coal and gas, and customers will get it from elsewhere if they don't get it from Australia. Australia's resources industry pumped $39 billion into Australian and state government coffers in 2020-21 in royalties and taxes and contributed a record $301 billion to the economy. The mining sector directly employs more than 270,000 people and the number of workers employed in the sector has doubled over the last 15 years. We simply do not have a replacement for that income stream or employment sector. Employment in the sector grew by 11 per cent in the year to February 2022, creating over 25,000 new jobs. The resources sector provides jobs and opportunities in many rural and regional areas that have been doing it tough. The renewable projects will not bring those same number and well-paid jobs. And in my short time as Shadow Minister, I've met with dozens of mining executives and seen the extraordinary measures being implemented to protect the environment. In fact, more environmental scientists are employed by mining companies than anywhere else. The Queensland Resources Council states that about a quarter of Queensland mines use renewable energies. Two thirds of the state's resource companies plan to invest in lowering their emissions in the next 12 months and 40 per cent of them are already actively investing in low emissions technology. The International Energy Agency World Energy Outlook projects that total coal, oil and gas demand will grow. The IEA confirms that coal and gas will remain an important part of the world's energy mix for decades into the future, with coal remaining, remaining the single largest source of electricity in 2040, which means that gas and coal will continue to play a vital role in Australia's energy mix for the foreseeable future. The Greens base their demands on a desire to prevent tree clearing and reducing emissions, but this is the same party that, while it dem demands governments build one million new homes, but at the same time oppose any new residential development that requires even minor tree clearing. They don't seem to protest about the trees cleared for wind and solar projects, showing a selective outrage that destroys credibility. The mining industry would employ more environmental scientists, invest more into environmental uh, uh, surveys uh, and research, and operate under some of the world's strictest environmental laws. We should be encouraging these experienced, mature players to ramp up operations, employ more people on double the average wage and provide the royalties and taxes that pay for infrastructure. If we follow the Greens' leads, we would sacrifice the thousands of mum and dad businesses that mining supports and supports scores of regional towns. Gas is still in huge demand in Australia and around the world, not just for energy production, but also for urea production, a critical part of agricultural fertilisers, and add blue, a component for the agricultural uh, industry and transport industry. Australia can have a plan to utilise more renewables, but good planning takes time. This fanciful notion from the Greens should not be supported. It is the green tail wagging the Labor dog. Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President, this is not my first speech. They're calling this the climate parliament because it has to be. The future of people and nature across the country, across the globe, depends on the action that this parliament will take. It's because a third of the people in this country voted for someone other than the major parties, many of them electing Greens and independents. It's the climate parliament 
because the next three years are going to determine if we can use political power for good to work together and deliver climate action. And we must do so. Let's be clear, we are running out of time on this. And failure comes at an impossibly high cost. If we keep pumping carbon into the atmosphere, we will destroy ecosystems and threaten the lives of billions of people. The thing to do now is simple. It's to stop digging up coal and gas. You can't put out the fire while pouring petrol on it. We need to plan for and then deliver the end of coal and gas. Pretending we can continue with business as usual while the planet is taking it in turns to burn and then drown is delusional. We know because every credible climate scientist has told us this, that emissions from burning coal and gas are driving the climate crisis. And we need to plan for a future for coal-dependent communities in places like the Hunter in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Pretending we can continue business as usual with these industries as they chaotically shut down while cooking the planet also betrays those coal-dependent communities. It's not fair to them who deserve a safe and prosperous post-coal future, which will not be delivered by a government with its head in a mine. We need to stand with First Nations people in this fight for country. It's their country, and that means joining with traditional owners, such as the Wanara Plains people in the beautiful Hunter Valley who are fighting for country after so much of their land, their culture and their connection has been stolen by multi-billion dollar mining corporations. And in New South Wales, we've seen the Ravensworth Homestead, site of appalling frontier conflict, violence and murder of First Nations people being threatened with the expansion of an open-cut coal mine from the global bottom-feeding corporation that is Glencore. A climate catastrophe and an act of cultural devastation all in one proposal. But Glencore did not account for the powerful First Nations resistance of the Wanara Plains people. They've fought this proposal. They've rallied and they've lobbied and they're still fighting. And we stand with them and we stand together to fight for our collective future. And the decision on protecting their land and their water, their connection to country, now lies with the new Labor Environment Minister. And if land, culture, country and the future mean anything, there is only one decision she can make, and that better make Glencore bloody unhappy. This week, a record 12 Green senators in this place and 16 MPs across the parliament are ready to deliver on that clear mandate for change. And while the threats are real and the destruction is brutal, the good news is that dealing with climate change is an almost impossibly big opportunity for Australia. While other countries need to end coal and import energy, we can end coal and become a green energy superpower. Australia has the highest wind and solar capacity of any developed nation and a wealth of critical green energy materials. That gives us an extraordinary leg up in the post-cold world we need to start building. And that is why, as Greens, we will keep pushing Labor further and faster to make Australia a world leader in clean energy. This is essential for the planet. It is essential for nature. And it's bloody amazing for Australia. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As an engineer, I respect and consult scientists because lives have depended on it and still do. As an engineer educated in atmospheric gases and as a business manager, I was responsible for hundreds of people's lives based on my knowledge of atmospheric gases. I listen to scientists, I cross-examine scientists and I debate the science. I have never found anyone with the logical scientific, uh, logical scientific points based on empirical scientific evidence that shows we have anything to worry about at all. And the basics are this. When you burn a hydrocarbon fuel, you burn molecules containing carbon and hydrogen. With oxygen, they form CO2, carbon dioxide, and H2O, water vapour. That's it. Carbon dioxide is essential for all life. But let's go beyond the science and have a look at natural experiment. We've had two natural experiments, global experiments, in the last 14 years. The first was in 2009, when the use of hydrocarbon fuels in the recession that followed the global financial crisis reduced. There was less carbon dioxide produced from, from human use of hydrocarbons. And what, did that, what happened to the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? It kept increasing. And what happened in 2020? 
when we had a, a major recession, almost a depression around the world as, as a result of COVID restrictions placed by governments. We saw the same reduction in hydrocarbon fuel used by humans, the same cut in carbon dioxide output from humans, and yet carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued increasing. And those who understand the science understand that it is fundamental. Humans cannot and do not affect the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's controlled by nature entirely. In my I've cross-examined the CSIRO for three times now in the last few years. Under my cross-examination, which is the first of its kind in this country and the only one of its kind in the world, the CSIRO admitted that they have never stated that carbon dioxide from human activity is dangerous. Never stated it. This is all rubbish that we're being talked about. They secondly admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. Thirdly, they never quantified in three meetings any specific impact of carbon dioxide from human activity. Never. That is the fundamental basis for policy. What's more, they showed their sloppiness because they withdrew discredited papers that they initially cited to me at their choice as evidence of unprecedented rate of temperature change and then failed to provide the empirical scientific evidence. They withdrew the papers, the two papers they put to me on temperatures, the two papers they put to me on, on uh, carbon dioxide. There is no danger. Temperatures are not unprecedented. We need to come back to the science, not the so-called experts that the Greens talk about, not the pixies at the bottom of the garden. Come back to the science, the empirical scientific evidence, and base policies on that. Senator Still John. Thank you. After the most progressive election result of our time, uh, with more Greens in the Senate and in the House of Representatives than ever before, uh, determined to demand uh, that the climate crisis uh, is something which is addressed on behalf of our communities. Uh, the parliament, every single one of us in this place, uh, is here uh, with one question uh, over our heads, and that is, will we act in this critical moment? Now, there's a good saying that many of in, in our community hold to, and that is that actions speak louder than words. And in relation to the climate crisis, no act can be more impactful than the decision to keep fossil fuels in the ground. One particular project which seeks to do the very opposite of this, uh, which is an incredible concern to so many community members uh, in Western Australia, is that of, of Woodside's Scarborough gas development. This disastrous plan is shaping up to become part of Australia's most dangerous fossil fuel project. If it goes ahead, this me mega gas plant uh, off the northwest coast of WA will single handedly increase national emissions by over 10 per cent. Now, I need you all here to understand how significant that is. This project will release as much pollution as around 20,000 airplane flights around the circumference of the earth every single day for the next 25 years. This project irreversibly threatens First Nations cultural heritage, including the 45,000-year-old World Heritage Murujuga Art uh, Precinct, a rock art uh, area. It puts marine life at risk. It, put, it puts life itself at risk. At a time when the rest of the world is scrambling to reduce emissions to tackle climate change, uh, every year the Albanese government uh, is uh, the Albanese opposition and now in government has accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from Woodside and other mega fossil fuel corporations looking to have their death plants approved. Now the science here is irrefutable. The mining and burning of coal, oil and gas is fueling the climate crisis. And yet, despite being on the literally sweltering front line of the climate crisis, Western Australia continues to enjoy the dubious honour of being the worst performing state on climate action in the country. Just last month, the WA Environmental Protection Agency recommended 
uh, ministerial approval for the 30-year extension of another cataclysmic Woodside project, the North West Shelf Gas Project. That alone will lock in an additional 43 billion tonnes of carbon pollution and single-handedly blow Australia's carbon emissions budget. I have little doubt that the McGowan government will roll out the red carpet for this project. In fact, last year, McGowan indicated that he would intervene to keep the project going, even if a push by conservation groups to block Scarborough gas in the WA Supreme Court was successful. Sadly, when I spoke about this six months ago, we were in the same position. Our community is fighting tirelessly against these projects every single day. Just last week, they flooded the EPA with a record-breaking number of appeals against the North West gas shelf expansion. Unlike the government, they know we must stop every new gas and coal project so that reaching net zero is absolutely achievable in this country. And the earlier we begin this inevitable transition, the smoother it will be. We can harness our abundant renewable resources to generate cheap and reliable energy while creating literally hundreds of thousands of jobs. We can take care of fossil fuel workers in this transition. This is the work that the community sent the Greens to this parliament to do. This is the work which we shall, shall you, now Senator get Steele. underway. Your time has expired.